Good morning, True. Dabana Mona. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest online business briefing from Business Advantage PNG, PNG's top ranked business magazine. My name is Andrew Wilkins. I'm the publishing director at Business Advantage International, and I'm your host for this morning's session. We have viewers this morning not only from all over Papua New Guinea, uh, but also from right across the world, uh, from Australia, Japan, the USA, the UK, Germany, New Zealand, and Fiji, and also on Facebook Live. Welcome, one and all. Firstly, I'd like to thank KPMG, who are sponsoring this morning's event. This is enabling us to bring it to you free of charge, so our sincere thanks to Zani Theron and her team. Before we start, three things. I'd like to draw your attention to a new publication now available on our website. Uh, for quite some time, we have been building an online guide to doing business in PNG. It includes guides to all major industry sectors, every province, as well as legal and tax guides, and a guide to living and working in the country. This guide is now available for purchase as a 146-page digital publication called Doing Business in PNG 2020. To find out more, go to the Doing Business in PNG section on our website or email us at info at businessadvantageinternational.com. Now, um, as you're participating, please note there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screens. You can click on this tab to pose a question to our speakers this morning. And lastly, this session is being recorded and we will be sending you a link to the recording by email afterwards. Um, so uh, you won't miss out on anything if you have to leave early. Now to our topic. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented Papua New Guinea business with a unique set of challenges. Adapting to the new Palapasin or the new normal will require all of us to adapt, innovate and lead in new ways. In this special online briefing, we have the heads of three of PNG's leading companies and they're joining me to discuss how they are approaching this challenge in their own business and what the prospects for growth are for the year, year ahead. Between them, they represent many, many years of local and international management experience and represent businesses right across the economy, including manufacturing, transport, logistics, hospitality and financial services. Now, I spoke to Rupert Bray, the new Managing Director of Steamships, a little earlier, and we'll play that interview a little later this morning for you. But first, I'd like to welcome uh, this morning James Rice, the CEO of Paradise Foods, and Greg Pawson, the CEO of Kena Bank. So if we can bring them up on screen. Um, James, I know, had a little bit of issues earlier on with your video, but you look perfect Very now. Up. Well done, congratulations, welcome, and welcome to you to uh, Greg. Um, welcome, gentlemen. So um, what I'd like to do now is to talk, um, and we, we gave, I gave you three themes that I'd like to cover. And the first one, I guess, is adaptation. Obviously, there's enormous amounts of change going on right now um, and requiring you to respond to that change in real time often. often. So James, maybe we'll start with you. As far as uh, Paradise Foods business, what things have you had to adapt to either not by choice by because you just have to, but also there are things that you've done to actually adapt your business because of the current circumstances. Well, the first thing we had to do is adapt to protect our employees. So we started in February to have masks and to check temperature at the gate. Uh, we announced that we would not have our, allow our employees to be negatively impacted. So those employees who had to go home uh, because they were in outstations that had uh, quarantines and we continued to pay them. Uh, so we had to work to protect our employees. And then next thing was to hold our price because we realized that uh, consumers here are depending on our products as uh, daily food. Uh, they're depending on our low price and the value that they get for that. So uh, we've committed to hold our price this year. And it's something we can talk about later. I think it's our challenge for next year that uh, people aren't going to have the option to really take a price up. And for us, our adaptation now will be uh, really controlling costs and keeping our price down so that we don't change anything in the market where we face our consumer. Was there anything you had to do to adapt your supply chain? Because obviously it's not every, everybody, there were, maybe your supply chain was somewhat disrupted. It was disrupted. It was a, a lot of roadblocks. Uh, we had, I doubled my incoming inventory. So I needed a longer chain because of products that were coming from overseas, you know, our, uh, the wrapping material, for example, 
and uh, flour or corn. Uh, and then delivering to customers was more difficult. So we've had so we've had to increase our finished goods inventory. We increased our raw material inventory, which of course increased our working capital. So that's been tougher. Uh, but we had a small run during the uh, the beginning of the SOE period. Our sales went up, uh, which you know was good, but uh, we weren't expecting that kind of a, a peak. Um, sales almost went up fifty percent in two weeks, and kind of emptied us out. Wow, that's quite a jump. Greg, yeah. uh, maybe we we'll turn to you. Um, adaptation in financial services, I imagine, would be very, very different from a manufacturing and uh, and wholesale operation. Uh, yeah. How did Kina have to adjust? Well, it, it's funny, you know. You talk about the new normal. Being a banker, I remember they talked about the new normal after the GFC, the global <laughs> financial crisis, and now, now it's COVID nineteen. But look, as an essential services industry, we obviously had to maintain normal business hours, we had, had to stay open to, to be able to pr provide financial services to the community. So that was the first point. And again, as a bank, we have quite a, a robust business continuity plan in place in any event. And we did have actually a pandemic response plan as part of that. So it was really a case of enacting that plan um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that we were able to maintain business continuity. The two, two week sort of state of emergencies we had here in Port Moresby, we did move to restricted hours. I think we were operating from, you know, 10 till three. Obviously with public transport out, we had to put on um, staff transport and we've actually continued to do that because um, it, it actually resulted in quite a significant uplift in productivity, I have to say. And, you know, some of the security issues, particularly during the curfew and so forth, uh, that was simply the right thing to do. And as James said, a, a huge focus within the company just on personal hygiene, and ensuring people were being tested and wearing face masks and 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 you know the um the temperature checks i, I hate those things because they hold them up to the site yeah, head but um we, we had all that in place very very early on and all our branches restricted the numbers of customers coming in at one time so that we could um ensure that we had social distancing happening as well um and, and i guess too where possible we did allow staff to work from home obviously in an environment like PNG, that's difficult to do. But where that was possible, we permitted staff that were coming in quite long distances. I mean, here in Port Moresby, for example, we've got people out at 14, 15, 16 mile. Um, so we connected them, VPN access as well, which worked, um, which worked really well. But pretty much everyone's back, back in the office now. Um, and, and, you know, in hindsight, I think a lot of the things that we actually put into practice, um, we were planning to do, we just brought them forward. Right. Right. Mm. James, just a, uh, your, your manufacturing me base means that you need to have physically people in your factories to actually produce right. the goods. There's no escaping that fact, is there? So have you changed the workflow in your workplace uh, as a result of, uh, of, of these new requirements perhaps being placed on you? Well, no, we, we could not because as you point out, you know, we're old school manufacturing and we need people here. And yep. uh, it's very labor intensive what we do because the way we do it, we have old equipment. And our, our challenge was getting people here. So we had to hire a lot of buses and cars to, to get people here. We were the first company that got an exemption to be called an essential services from, from the government. And uh, everybody came. You know, I had very few people could work from home. We needed hands on deck. Yeah. And uh, have you been giving particular advice to your employees about how they need to not just behave in the workplace, but also how they need to um, conduct themselves outside of the workplace as well? Well, it's been a nonstop education process of, uh, of hygiene, cleanliness, uh, making sure people don't come to, serve, to work when they're sick, uh, which they tend, tend to do, because you know, they don't want to use up their vacation days uh, on that. And uh, that's something we repeat all the time. We, we send people home often when they look sick, <laughs> uh, but we've not had anybody with, with this, with COVID, thank God, but uh, we've had some close calls, we think, of, sick people coming um i guess the other thing is that to a certain extent the budgets or the, the 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 financial planning that you've already done probably had to be torn up at this stage yeah we because we spent a lot of money on transportation yeah. uh a lot of money on delivering products and uh as far as working capital financing i had did not intend to double my finished goods inventory you know because right. i had to i didn't want to take a risk of somebody upstream for me 
going out of business or having an interruption and knocking me out of business. Greg, how's that uh, presented itself in Keener's business? I mean, you must have had done your budgets, what, this time last year for, for, for 2020. Um, it must be a very, very different looking budget right now. Well, pleasingly, it's actually not. Um, surprisingly, we're, we're doing okay and we're, we're on yep. track in terms of our original budget forecast. I mean, as you know, we're a publicly listed company, so we have to disclose our results every six months. Um, at the half year, we, we were sort of on plan. The thing that we've been carefully watching, obviously, um, and, and in conjunction with the central bank here, because they put in place um, some relief in the early stages of COVID-19 for customers that were stressed, particularly customers that are borrowers. Um, so we've been keep, keeping a very close eye on that. We moved quite quickly actually to set up two, two sort of, um, I guess, intensive care, for want of a bit of a term, um, triages for personal customers and business customers that were experiencing um, stress and needed to reach out to us. But we had a bit of a run on early, but obviously they had to be able to evidence that it was in relation to the pandemic. Um, and, and as I say, pleasingly, um, that virtually today we're not getting any any inquiries coming coming through. I think at one point we had about 80 customers on relief that finished at the end of September, and most of those are back on track, which is really good. But I, I think it depends, you know, on what industry sectors you're actually exposed to. And as a bank, we didn't have a great deal of exposure to, to the sectors that were impacted the most, such as you know transport, hotels, accommodation supply chains to the resources sector, et cetera. And, and given, you know, we're, we're a little bit smaller, the, the impact wasn't, um, wasn't, wasn't significant. We, we're being encouraged to see this new, uh, the, the new normal as, uh, as a stable um, situation where perhaps the rules that you're being required to follow aren't going to change substantially anymore. Uh, fingers crossed that's the case. So you anticipate needing to make any additional changes or do you feel like you're kind of in a stable uh, uh, set of circumstances now as far as managing the situation? Well, I feel like our business is stable. Uh, yep. We've made the adjustment we're used to what it is now. Uh, we're not going to see we're not going to see lockdowns or slowing down of the economy. I think the government's done with that and uh, we're, we're, we're back. You know, my line for that is that we hit a pothole in a rising road and, you know, that's behind us now. Yes, similar for us, Andrew. I think we, we had um, enacted sort of a, an initiative to split our teams. So, you know, where we had a contact center or what one, all our ICT staff, for example, in one site, we moved fairly early on to, to split them and, and lo locate them at separate separate parts of, um, of the business, which worked really well. In the event that we did have a case of COVID-19 or somebody you know closely associated with someone that, that was tested positive, um, but we've actually now moved back, the teams are back where, where they were. So we're kind of seeing things um, pretty much back to, to business as usual, which is good. Excellent. So I guess the next thing I'd like to touch on is um, maybe how your businesses are more creatively responding to the challenge. And I guess that comes into the area of innovation. Um, it's one thing to respond to the immediate health requirements, but there, is a business, there are business opportunities that come out of this circumstance. And there are also maybe things that you've been looking to do anyway that you're able to either fast track or even to um, just keep producing um, as, as you go forward. So as far as innovation is concerned, Greg, I know one of the big areas that Keen has been involved with in the in the recent times is e-commerce and getting more um, e-commerce not just in business but also for government mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so um the the, the COVID-19 actually the pandemic's done us a lot of favors in that respect I think because far more of our customers now are transacting digitally and, and it's it's interesting in saying that because um you know, before the pandemic, probably 60% 60, 60 of our customers were transacting digitally with us in any event through ATMs, through POS machines, through mobile apps, USSD platforms, et cetera. Um, that's lifted by about 10% to around 70%, which is great for us because, you know, as you said, our aspirations to be the leading digital bank in PNG. So a lot of our technology is based around transacting with us digitally. and. The cost of, you know, as you can imagine, transporting cash and, and just managing the sheer volume of checks in the system here in PNG is, is 
particularly onerous and poses all sorts of operational risks for us that um, digital and e-commerce platforms don't. So um, we, we, we've we've launched a lot of new things over the last uh, three or four months. You know, we we enhanced our internet banking platform, our mobile banking, and Kina Connect, which is our USSD platform, which is um, proving very very popular. Um, we introduced our POS Tap and Go network. We've got about two and a half thousand machines out there now. A thousand of those we rolled out over the past three to four months. We launched integrated POS um, about a month ago, so we're currently testing that with a, a couple of the larger retailers at the moment. Um, our internet payment gateway, we um, we launched that about a month ago, and that's in pilot at the moment with the lands department, and we went live actually with the immigration department um, two weeks ago as well on that front. And, and that's really exciting for us because one, one of the things that we've been pushing hard is to get the government engaged around e-commerce. That's the starting point, because once they're in the tent, then the rest follows suit. And pleasingly, they've been hugely um, behind this and, and very supportive of what we're trying to do, particularly with the partnership that we've got, which has been much publicised with, uh, with NewPay here in PNG. Um, we're about to launch um, our, what we call digital concierge in our branches, which is basically uh, a setup of... Um, a facility in branch for customers to be able to use um, our online banking services. And it's more designed for customers that don't have access to that outside of the branch, you know, that might not have Wi-Fi or they're living in a community that they don't have access to telecommunications to show them and teach them how to use these services um, outside of standing in a queue or sitting and waiting to be to be served in the traditional way. Um, so, so COVID-19, it's been quite interesting because one of the concerns we had was you know, a lot of our vendors that are helping us get this technology up and running, um, much of it new to PNG, uh, are based offshore. But I, I don't know. I think the fact that um, the pandemic's been in place has meant that they've been performing exceptionally well. And we haven't had is any issues with, you know, not meeting deadlines or release dates or even, you know, pilot programs, which has been really good. So in some respects, I'm, I'm quite keen for this uh, new normal to continue. <laughs> <laughs> James, uh, we've, we've spoken a couple of times about your goals for Paradise Foods um, uh, and uh, your, your feeling, well, I know when we first met, uh, when you were very, very new in the role, um, you, you saw enormous potential for the business. So what sort of innovations uh, have you been pursuing or are you uh, likely to pursue because of either because of the current situation or just because you're, you're driving forward as a business? I would say in spite of the situation, we're driving forward in the yep. business, but we still have the same goal of doubling the business in five years. And uh, we're going to invest 160 million Kina in lay next year on new capacity expansion, new facilities. It'll add another 300 jobs in the city. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And uh, we're not slowing down on anything. And uh, following behind that very closely will be the expansion of our chocolate factory where we're looking for opportunities to export Queen Emma chocolate to outside of the country. And our vision is that it would be the first global brand of PNG. So uh, this this crisis just means you, you just keep investing, keep going. You know, I stick with my line, it's a pothole in a rising road. And if you wait till it's over and everything is good, then you're going to be a year behind me, I think. <laughs> so where do you see the export market being for, for your products? Is it just, just the chocolate? Yeah, the other products that we have, you know, are, are, are value products at a low price point. Great for Papua New Guinea, but it's not something I could, I would never make money shipping one Kina pack of biscuits anywhere. Uh, but our uh, Queen Emma chocolate, you know, because it's, it's family farmed, it's organic, it's fair trade, it's sustainable. It's everything that's actually quite sexy in a brand outside of it. Ticks a lot of boxes, isn't it? Yes, it's really quite amazing. So something that we sell for five Kina here would be a six US, six US dollar chocolate bar in the United States. So we want to get it over there. Absolutely. Have you made any changes to how you source your projects, uh, source your products, sorry, or your inputs into your into your ingredients and so on? Yeah, it was always my strategy starting last year to localize everything. And yep. uh, you know, some things we won't be able to. So milk, milk powder, butter, and and wheat and flour is still going to come from outside, but uh, other things have localized, and we've uh, uh, brought in a lot of things that were imported, now made here, and we're working with suppliers to come here. So our our preformed bottle manufacturer, who makes the bottles for our True True Water brand, is going to move their facility from Malaysia to Lay, so uh, he'll be in there. Our uh, label manufacturer is going to add equipment, and we're we're uh, working with their bank 
we said, you finance that equipment, we'll buy all their products. So that'll bring more jobs there. So uh, piece by piece, we're, we're, uh, we're bringing it all back home. Uh, you know, just recently we brought peanut butter. We used to be sourced in Australia, and now it's coming from Alatau. Does that place a particular challenge on you to manage that supply chain a bit more effectively, or to actually talk to get more uh, details with your suppliers about yeah, what you need and how you need it? It is, it is details, right? Yep. And especially where the capacity doesn't exist here, or the skills, or that type of product, you have to teach them how to make it. And uh, you know, I have to commit to volume, and they have to commit they're going to do it right at the right price and good quality. Then we can do it. But it's a it's a real win for the country, you know. And um, even the the you know the caps for our, our water bottle that's just only five jobs, but it's five more jobs here. They were in Malaysia, and they're going to be here now. And you know, it's better for everyone. And five more people employed means five more people buying my products, and five more people banking with Greg. And it, you know, it's exponential, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I guess the, a lot of the conversation right now in PNG is about supporting particularly small and medium sized enterprises to encourage them. One of the best things you can do for a small business is to give them a consistent customer, isn't it? To say, I'm, I'm willing to buy a guaranteed amount of product from you if you can supply it. And I have enough volume to make a business for somebody, you know, like come yep. and say, okay, you make this peanut butter for me and I'll buy it for my peanut cookies. You know, it, it, it's good. And, you know, when I circle around with them to the bank, uh, it, it helps a lot. And in the case of the, the, uh, my packaging supplier, you know, I told her, I said, well, okay, if you want me to go to my competitors with you and say, buy from her, I said, I'll do it. Cause, uh, it, all, it means jobs back here and, and, uh, you know, her factory has got to be full can't just be me. I, I only fill half the machine. So uh, we'll help where we can. I think it's it's good news for the country. It's what we need. Yeah. Talking of SMEs, Greg, uh, um, the government uh, started, uh, presented, or the Prime Minister presented a giant check to one of your competitors this week for uh, 100 million kina, which yeah. apparently is going to go to um, subsidize loans to SMEs. Kina Bank isn't participating in that particular scheme, but you, you were mentioning to me earlier that you actually do have a, a scheme of your own that you're looking to particularly target and support SMEs. Yeah, yeah, we are. And, and look, um, I think it's great that the government is supporting SMEs and, and the whole aim of this 200 million funding package is really about access to, to cheaper loans. Um, and, and that's good, but I, I just reinforce that they are loans. So they have to be paid back at some point yes. in time. And I think there's, um, you know, some noise out there at the moment that it's free money. It's not free money. You know, this is for businesses that have got opportunities to expand and grow and clearly can demonstrate that they can pay back the, the loan that they're getting. For us, we're taking a slightly different approach. So we were invited to participate um, and and we did, we did do that. But then we, we sort of changed our mind at the 11th hour. We, we've got... Uh, quite an extensive funds management business here and I often get um, you know a lot of small businesses pointing the finger and saying you guys will not lend to us or you banks won't lend to us and mm. that's absolutely not the case I mean you know what one of the really positive things at the moment is there is a lot of domestic liquidity in PNG we've got truckloads of cash and the way banks make money is they take deposits and then lend it out to their customers that that's not the issue for many businesses it's it's the fact that they don't have any capital they actually don't have any equity. So when they come to us for a loan, they're asking us essentially to take on all the risk. Now, nobody's not gonna do that. You wouldn't do that personally if a friend asked you to, to lend them 100% of what they need. So for us, a slightly different um, approach, we're, we're actually gonna put $100 million into a SME capital fund and essentially invest in small businesses that have opportunities to um, expand and grow. And that could be domestically or it could be, you know, into exports offshore as well. Um, there'll obviously be some criteria around who we actually invest in. It won't be for mm. all businesses. But I, I think um, that that approach is probably something that PNG really needs right now. And, and, and as a bank, I mean, we, we have a vision to be, you know, world class diversified investment bank made here in PNG. Yes. Um, and this is an example of what a diversified, diversified sorry, investment bank can actually do, is take investments in businesses that have got lots of potential. Um, some other things that we want to do off the side of that is to be able to provide them with um, support 
that, that they might not have access to. And that could be financial support, not just what a traditional bank would do in terms of providing a loan or setting up POS machines or payment gateways or whatever, but actually financial support and budgeting and cash flow forecasting um, as part of that equity investment. And then, you know, for, for ancillary services like, oh, we, we actually want to, to develop a website or uh, we want to try and get into a new market, we, we would help them with that and maybe introduce them to new potential buyers of their products and so forth. So really exciting, early days, but we're just mapping out what that, um, what that will look like moving forward. And there's a lot of criticism actually at the moment because a number of facilities that were set up as sort of hubs for small businesses to go into and trade from are closing. Um, yep. So we're just looking at the moment with, with the acquisition of ANZ, we've got quite, quite a bit of surplus office space at the moment. <laughs> So we're trying to think about um, how we might be able to utilise that better. And one of the ideas our team had was, why not put some sort of incubation hub or, or a space where small businesses that don't have their own premises, probably more and things like, you know, ICT development and so forth could come in and we'll provide desktops and Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff and, and help support them on that front. So yeah, we're working on that at the moment. Very exciting. And um, just on the on the investment fund, the idea is to actually take equity in, That's in right. small businesses yes. um, for a period of time and then once they're up and running, maybe sell out of that equity or to be a yeah. long-term equity partner? Potentially, but I think it would be, depending on the company, more of a medium, long-term play. I mean, there's been a lot of talk, by the way, about doing this here in PNG, but it's yes, been more, it's... more about, you know, um, uh, private investors, philanthropists, etc. Um, putting money into a fund, but, but it just hasn't got anywhere. And, and something like that um, that's independent requires Security Commission approval. If we're doing it ourselves, we, we don't need to go through that laborious bureaucratic process. So we think hopefully we'll be able to do something along these lines early in 2021. It's be good. Very exciting. One of the other things that Keen has been involved with over the last uh, few months is a significant new capital raising effort. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, what's that money going to be used for, Greg? I, I laugh because it's exhausting. I don't want to go through one of these again in the short term, I can tell you. But um, look, it's really about sealing, sealing us up for, for, for the future. So we, we have quite a robust five-year strategic plan that takes us through five phases from sort of being a traditional bank to a digital bank to what we call bank as a partner. So not, not doing everything in isolation, but developing strategic partnerships. I guess the best example of that is the... Um, strategic partnership we have with MeBank, Nationwide Microfinance Bank here, using helping them by using our infrastructure to expand their financial inclusion programs. Um, bank as a service, so that, that's similar to the new pay initiative around partnering them for, for you know, our internet, internet um, payment gateway platforms, etc. and eventually um, becoming this diversified investment bank uh, made in PNG. And, and I think, you know, that, that's really cool because a lot of what we're doing particularly in relation to infrastructure, is here with Papua New Guinea, with nationals. Um, you know, we, we, we did pretty much that um, ANZ um, acquisition, and that was a complex program of work because we migrated close to 135,000 customers from, from ANZ's banking platform to ours. We did that mostly with local staff, which is very, very cool. So, and, and as a result of that, it's kind of lifted the capability here quite significantly, which I think is great. But the capital raising is really about positioning us for the next five years to be a stronger bank and to be able to compete more so at the upper end of the, the commercial and corporate sectors here in PNG. And it's not to say that we couldn't previously, but it, it, it lifts our sort of single borrower limits. Um, and, you know, a, a, as a bank, our strategy is really about whole of bank relationships. We don't want to, to, to just be a debt customer to, to um, a customer. We, we want a whole of bank relationship. So, it's really driven around that. But but it also means, as a publicly listed company, we're pretty set now for, for the foreseeable future, which is great. Right. And by the way, it was very successful. So oversubscribed, we raised about 100 million AUD. And I think that sends a, a wonderful message that, you know, offshore, despite some of the challenges that we've had, particularly um, getting some of these larger resource projects away, that people do have an interest and a degree of confidence in Papua New Guinea. I think that's really good. Excellent. Well, as a as a, as a shareholder in Keener Securities, I thank you very much. And I look forward to, to the uh, share price moving up. The, up, the uptick, <laughs> hopefully. Um, 
I wanted to talk to you both about leadership because obviously this is a, a time uh, when a, a, gr a good leader uh, can actually make a significant difference to a business. Uh, before I jump onto that though, just to remind people that if they do have a question or a comment they want to make to either James or Greg this morning, they can use the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, and pose a question. Um, we have had one comment about the quality of your shirt, James, but I won't necessarily uh, draw attention to that. Um, but uh, let's talk about leadership, James. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> James, you, you have uh, significant experience, not just uh, from your time in PNG, but in uh, developing markets elsewhere in Southeast Asia, as well as, uh, of course, in the United States. Um, what have you learned about your leadership style during this time? Um, and have you had to make changes to the way you've led your business? Well, uh, my leadership style is very personal. I interact a lot with my employees. And I think here this time, people really needed to see that. You know, when when we started wearing masks and it was required, uh, employees need to see me walk around with a mask too. I'm not wearing it now because I'm in an office by myself, but uh, you know, you have to set that example. And uh, it was important when, when the first case was in Port Moresby was the first time that I could tell all my employees out on the production floor we're nervous and uh, we, we stopped production and a lot of the managing went down there and we started talking to people that we said, you know, it's safe to be here. This is a safe country. It's a safe city. It's a safe place to work. You know, we knew nobody was, was sick here. And uh, uh, at this time, I think people really need that personal interaction and some reassurance. And now if you talk about leadership, I, it's very similar, maybe on a bigger picture that we keep the positive message out there we talk about our growth plans. You know, the fact that this did not slow down our growth plans and we're still investing 160 million Kina next year. We're creating 300 more jobs. That's, that's a lot of reassurance, whether you work for yes. me or you're standing outside and you want a job for me, uh, it, it's good news. And uh, we need to keep that, that foot forward. And as far as managing your managers or empowering your, your, your senior staff, have you um, been giving any particular guidance to them? Uh, it's uh, really the same message, which is just to keep repeating the positive news, to set a good example, and to remind people that they're coming to work here is safe. And uh, we don't, we're careful about who comes through that door, and it's clean, it's hygienic, and you got something good to eat. It's, it's a good place to be. And uh, we tell our staff, we, we think you're better off here than you are going home, and, and, and don't worry about it. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to protect people and keep it safe, and, and I think that's good. It's a good message. And, uh, yeah. So far, you know, yesterday I had 100% uh, attendance. Nobody's out sick, and today is the same thing. So, this this is good. Good sign, Greg. Um, your leadership style. Um, have you have you found it challenged, or have you found what have you discovered about your own ability as a leader oh, over this time? I've discovered a lot, and and I would say <laughs> a lot of, lot of similarities to what what James was describing. That, you know, I, I think in the early stages, from when we did get that first case, that the, the hardest thing, and it was actually quite exhausting, if I'm honest, was just controlling the hype and the hysteria. Mm -hmm. And much of that, you know, driven through through media and a lot of the um, restrictions that were starting to come into play as well, to, to just really get people to think about what they can control versus what they can't control. So, you know, a big focus on personal hygiene, doing the right thing, wearing masks, all those sorts of things were high on our agenda, screensavers, reinforcing, you know, on our desktops, all the things that we needed to do to protect staff and protect the community. Um, but that, you know, that, that was challenging. For, for me, it was about visibility, you know, just making sure that I was out across the business, that they could see that there was a degree of empathy for what we were facing. And, and you know, that, that a lot of the stuff that, 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 that they were seeing was hype and, and it was about, you know, focusing on the facts. And a lot of that was about prevention. So um, I spent a lot of time out and about just in the branches, you know, in, in our various offices, obviously some restrictions around domestic travel made it difficult to connect with our provincial locations, but we were WebExing them in and talking to them quite frequently about, um, you know, how to cope with this new environment. For, for my exec team, um, look, it was interesting in terms of how some of them reacted, because there was, I think, um, a propensity to panic for some of them, and of course, if we as an executive team are doing that, it just cascades through the whole organization. So yep. a, a big focus in terms of resilience, 
you know, um, agility, being able to adapt quickly um, was important. And just communication, communication and more communication. Lots of sort of online forums with staff, um, lots of internal programs. We really ramped up through that period um, our sort of reward and recognition program. We call it the Nova Awards, just um, so that we could actually, you know, appreciate people that were going above and beyond uh, during what was a difficult time. Um, so, yeah, a, a big, big focus. We're actually taking that to the next level next month. We've got um, a, a leadership program we're running in, in conjunction with Franklin Covey here, which will start with myself and, and my direct reports. And then early in 2021, we're going to cascade through, cascade that through the organisation. I think the timing is just perfect for that in light of what we've just been through. Another kind of leadership, I guess, is also the leadership that a company shows to the community generally. And I guess both of you run businesses that are very highly visible, established, well-respected um, corporate citizens, if you like. So um, is there a sense, uh, James, we'll maybe start with you, of, of uh, what leadership Paradise Foods needs to send to its community or to its customer base or to the country at large? Yeah, and I think that our communication early on had a lot of impact on why our sales are up and why we had no negative impact during this. I think that the community responded to our corporate responsibility. You know, we said uh, day one that we would not let any of our employees be negatively impacted. So employees that we had to send home for various reasons were paid uh, full salary. Uh, we said we would not raise our price. We will not allow customers to raise our price and we we're going to protect our consumers. And uh, these two things, I think, resonated very well with the community. It's uh, it's a good step of social responsibility. Uh, you know, we've been here for 80 years and we've made money for 80 years. So a couple months of hardship uh, uh, absorbing that, I think is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's our responsibility and, and we did well. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, our sales are up 31% over last year. That's quite astronomical. There's a, a lot of reasons for that, a lot of hard work that we've done. But I think one of those is the community responding to our leadership in, in this crisis. Mm -hmm. Greg, did you want to add to that? Yeah, look, for, for us, um, you know, the, the most effective way to, for us to reach uh, customers and communities more broadly, believe it or not, is social media platforms. So, you know, through through Instagram and, and Facebook and, and Twitter and um, what whilst sort of telling them the things that we're doing and what they can expect to see, particularly if they, they come physically to, to a branch, um, it was more about trying to get some feel-good stuff in there too. So we... we you know, um, did a lot of work around celebrating Independence Day. We did a video. We've got three brand ambassadors who, who spoke. Um, and, and, you know, from that, we had about 750,000 hits. It was just phenomenal. So it was more about, you know, again, let's focus the community on what we can control versus what we can't and make sure we're doing the right things. And I, I think that's held us some, um, you know, there's been, I'd have to say, some frustrations, I think, from customers that, have um, have had to queue to get into branches because we don't you know we only allow 10 staff in at one time in our bigger locations but um, we, we've, we've been able to manage that I think reasonably well and people understand why which is the important thing. Excellent uh, before we go to uh, the uh, pre-recorded interview with uh, with Rupert Bray from Steamships uh, a couple of questions uh, come through um, one one for you Greg and one one for uh, for James um, this uh, anonymous attendee, you may be there from, uh, from Sydney, I don't know, your former employer. Um, question for Greg, uh, interested in his views regarding the noise about Westpac leaving the country and what opportunities does that create for Keener Bank? I thought that might come up, <laughs> um, funnily enough. I think a lot of people are thinking we, um, we just went through this capital raising for that reason. Um, look, I, I, the, the only thing I would say there is um, we, we, we're obviously cashed up. Um, we, we are in a position to look at further merger and acquisition opportunities, uh, particularly here in PNG, and that's, that's where our business is. That's what we're about. Um, but they do have to be strategically aligned to the five-year plan that I talked about before. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a bit of work to do around that stuff. But certainly, if they approached us, we would be interested in having a chat too. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, this uh, question this from Mark Turner. Um, maybe James might uh, say it to you. Many PNG uh, companies have experienced uh, a reduction in expat numbers um, uh, in recent times. Um, do you think the pandemic has provided opportunities for local PNG people and PNG businesses to step up in their jobs? 
Well, that's a, that's a double-edged sword because it should be that an expat is here to cover a competency that doesn't exist and not just covering a job in lieu of uh, Papua New Guinea. And so uh, I think that this, this crisis shouldn't change that, but if there's more opportunities for Papua New Guineans, that's really good. For our company, you know, there's a there's a secret list of uh, that I have given to the board of directors <laughs> of locals that uh, that should take the roles of us expats. So hopefully, you know, in a period between two years and, and maybe six, uh, we'll be totally localized regardless of a pandemic or not. But it's our responsibility to raise the competencies, transfer the skills, and get them ready to do that. Excellent. What we might do now is just uh, end, end this particular part of the conversation. Greg and James, you're very welcome to stay online if you want to and, and enjoy the rest of the session. But if you have to run away, I know you're both very, very busy men. Um, so that would be fine as well. Um, what we're going to do now is just, um, as I mentioned previously, the new managing director at Steamships Trading Company, Rupert Bray, wasn't able to join us live this morning, but he and I spoke earlier, and I'd like to show that conversation to you now. Um, Steamships is one of PNG's most established and diversified businesses. Um, owning companies such as Coral Sea Hotels, uh, Consort Express Lines, and Pacific Palms Property. So if we can roll that video now, please. So let's talk about steamships businesses and how they've had to respond and adapt to the new circumstances you find yourselves in this year. Uh, what kind of things have you either been forced to adapt to or have you chosen to adapt? Yeah, sure. Um, I think... Obviously, it goes without saying that as a conglomerate with a very large mobile workforce with a lot of customer contact and public contact, um, our business has been fairly heavily affected by the restrictions of COVID. Um, and we've had to adjust the way we've worked uh, and reduce that human interface, both within the office, within the businesses, and also with the customer. A good example of that is, is the um, contactless stevedoring that Consult Express Lines and Joint Venture Port Services have put in place where um, the interaction between the mobile shipboard crew and the less mobile regional port crews have been completely reduced to almost nothing. Um, and what that's meant is that there is no transmission risk in that particular interaction. And we've had to do that in hotels uh, with the customer interface. We've had to do it on a, on a B2B level as well. So that's a very practical um, adaptation we've had to make. Then from a financial perspective, uh, COVID has, has hit us like a truck. Um, and our hospitality businesses in particular have, have went from being very full to almost empty overnight when the restrictions came in. And therefore, we've had to adapt both from a staffing perspective and a, and a cost management perspective. And in the hotel business, that was very sharp. Uh, and, and very aggressive. Uh, we've done that by implementing flexible working, uh, voluntary unpaid leave schemes, uh, and co-working schemes. And the teams have done exceptionally well at adapting to that. Uh, our managers have had to um, do the same amount of work with fewer people, um, but also the staff who have been directly affected uh, have been very flexible and very, very resilient. So those are the adaptations that we've already made. Um, perhaps we can talk a little bit about some of the ones that, that might still be there going forward. Yes, I was, that's what I thought. What, what more adaptation do you anticipate? I mean, this is uh, to a certain extent uncharted territory, isn't it, for, for most businesses? Well, it's interesting. When I was, I was thinking about this uh, recently, of course, it's, it's not entirely uncharted because we've had SIRS, we've had MERS, we've had Ebola. Uh, and now we've got COVID-19. So, so I fear this isn't the last of, of pandemics that we will see. And the world's population has grown, it's more interconnected. So we're going to be facing these challenges again. So some of the things that we're looking at now is how that we make our businesses more pandemic resilient going forward. Mm. And at a very practical level, we run many or several of the largest buildings here in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so we have to leverage technology to remove some of the, the choke points that were not considered before. Uh, and that may be simple things uh, around, again, contactless lifts and how you get people movement through buildings, shopping malls, how you build in the ability to check people's temperatures using technology, cameras, sensors, et cetera. So you actually, you're doing this in a non-invasive way. At the moment, it's very much in your face. 
but uh, as we move forward, it's probably going to become more systemic to the way we do business. Um, <clears throat> and then on, on the sort of technology side, we have to accept that there will be periods of remote working. Uh, and people have got used to it, perhaps less so in Papua New Guinea, uh, but it has shown the power of remote working and the ability to have that flexibility. Uh, and so I think from, for, for us, being able to leverage the, the opportunities that the digital aid provides will be paramount going forward. So that leads me nicely into the topic of innovation. Um, and I guess that's what a lot of companies are now having to do, is having to reimagine, rethink their business mm -hmm. and look at ways to do things smarter, differently, to do things to protect their bottom line. So what kind of innovation um, have you been fostering within your group? And what, what, what green shoots of like innovation do you identify as being ones that are gonna drive your future business? Yes, uh, and it's interesting because I think a lot of the underlying trends were already there. Uh, the move to a digital economy, uh, the role that SMEs play in the development of, of the Papua New Guinean economy, these two, themes were already here and much talked about. However, they've been hastened by COVID. The thinking around it has been hastened by COVID. Um, and I think very much facilitated by the arrival of the Coral Sea Cable. Um, I, I arrived in Papua New Guinea only two years ago, but the opportunities now simply didn't exist two years ago. Um, and so we're looking very much at what it takes to transition a conglomerate like ours to the digital economy. And that's leveraging data, customer data, to provide more tailored services in the hotels. It's looking at being able to uh, leverage very simple systems like Microsoft uh, 365, the cloud version, which, which we haven't been able to do across the country. So that all of our divisions are on the same platform. They're using the same customer information, the same processes, so that customers then get for the first time a seamless experience across all of the different divisions. Um, and so, so there's very, one very much around leveraging systems and the opportunity that the Coral Sea Cable has, has um, created. And then I think the other thing that it's forcing us to do in terms of innovation is think about the business differently. Think about how we interact with each other in the office on a daily basis. What will the office look like? What does that mean for Pacific Palms property? What will the fly-in, fly-out workers that, and the consultants that very much have been part of Papua New Guinea in the past, what will they require in terms of quarantine or in terms of um, uh, reduced, uh, will they reduce? Will the numbers of fly-in, fly-out uh, workers reduce? Will their demographic change? So there's a lot of these things that are structural uh, that probably were going on in the background that have been hastened by COVID. Particularly in the area of uh, shipping and logistics, I'm wondering, is that an area where really there, there's an enormous dividend to be had from embracing technology uh, in particular? I think so. I mean, ultimately, and, and this is a long way away, um, technology and, and the Internet of Things will allow us to do things that we simply have not been able to do. Um, and we, we, we are beginning to see um, vessels that do not have crew on board. Uh, I think we are decades away from seeing that here, but in the short term, the access to data, the ability to do planned maintenance and remote monitoring of plant and equipment that will just improve our uptime and reduce the service interruptions that logistics inevitably experiences. That will be the same on our vessels, it will be the same on the trucks, um, right across our, our logistics businesses. I wanted to ask you about uh, leadership, uh, Rupert, in this time. And um, I'm sure there isn't a business manager or owner who hasn't had to think about how they're leading their business through this particular mm. challenging time and how they're going to lead their business out of it. On a personal level, um, what have you discovered about yourself as, as a leader in your business? Obviously, you're new to the role of managing director of steamships, but you've been in steamships and senior positions for a couple of years in PNG and elsewhere um, in several uh, management positions. What have you learned about your, your own uh, leadership style uh, in, in this particular crisis? <laughs> I think that a sense of humor and a sense of resilience are absolutely essential. 
Um, but I, I think uh, it's reinforced a very fundamental belief of mine, which is that there is no substitute for leaders being out there in the front line. So I have felt uh, disconnected from my team uh, because I've not physically been able to go and visit them. And that's forced us to think about how we use digital platforms and how we conduct remote town halls. Um, but also the need to ensure that um, our frontline managers are walking the talk. Mm -hmm. And we're very lucky in steamships. 99% of our uh, staff are Papua New Guinean. And I'm not sure that there are many uh, conglomerates around the world that can have that same level of homogeneity. And that has meant that all of our managers have stayed here. They've been here managing their businesses throughout the crisis. And that's given us a real sense of purpose. Uh, and so for me personally, reinforcing the need to be out in the front line, communicating pe with people and finding ways in the strange time of ours to get the messages coming from the front line back up to the corporate head offices and back down the other way. So that's perhaps uh, what COVID has heightened. I don't think that is anything particularly new. Um, but I think one of the things uh, that COVID has allowed us to do and the restructuring that has come has allowed us to do is continuing the march to a younger generation of manager. Um, and one of the things I'm particularly pleased with is we've recently promoted three fantastic Papua New Guinean managers. They're all under the age of 32 uh, into our senior leadership team, our executive leadership team. Um, two wonderful ladies, uh, one who is uh, Deborah Onger, who is now our group legal counsel, and uh, Saini Fisi'iho, who runs our HR division. And then Damon Pangali, who's come in and, and run our global HSEQ, so our safety, our environment, and our quality. So these three young managers very, very much represent the future of steamships, and uh, I hope uh, a representative of the future of, of Papua New Guinean uh, managers in general. So I think for those two things, that, that reinforcement of the need to be very much a frontline manager uh, and the ability that it's given us to make some fairly significant changes to our own leadership team. Uh, it's been a, an interesting, interesting time, as Winston Churchill said, during the dark days of World War II, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> Absolutely. And just finally, Rupert, um, as far as the, the tea, reading the tea leaves um, for steamships over the next uh, six, six months, probably 12 months is too far ahead, but um, what in your scenario planning are you expecting to happen within the sectors you operate in PNG and in PNG's economy more generally? Uh, it's, good. it's a good question, and, and TV reading and crystal ball gazing uh, is, uh, has been proven to be a, a particularly bad profession to be in recently. Uh, not many people have got it right. Um, so with that as a caveat, I think the, the interesting thing is that COVID has provided perhaps a distraction um, in that it has, it has distracted from the underlying challenge that we have, which is broadening the economic base and addressing the dire need to get a bit of an adrenaline shot back into the economy, which has fundamentally underperformed since 2015. Um, the challenges, the political challenges towards the end of this year and the election in 2022 uh, add increased volatility into that equation. So I think um, uh, the rest of this year and let's say the first half of next year will be subdued. Um, you know, all of the forecasters are predicting a fairly heavy GDP um, contraction this year and a slow recovery next. So steamships won't be uh, different from that, we won't be immune to it. Uh, so we anticipate a slow uh, remainder of this year, slow first half, and then a recovery through to the end of 2021. Um, the business that perhaps uh, we'll see a bigger pickup is the hotel business that was so badly hit uh, during the middle part of this year. Rupert, thank you very much for your time today. It's greatly appreciated. The best of luck over the months ahead. Um, uh, it's going to be a challenging ride. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to join you. That's all from us today. Um, our sincere thanks to Greg Pawson, um, to James Rice, to Rupert Bray, three very busy men who have kindly given their time uh, for you and for us this morning. Our thanks again to our sponsor, KPMG, um, and uh, 
Just a reminder that this online briefing has been the latest in an ongoing series. You can find them all, uh, previous ones, on our YouTube channel and look out for more briefings in the coming weeks and months. Um, to keep in touch with what's going on in PNG's economy and in business there, visit businessadvantagepng.com. Uh, until next time, stay well and good fortune to you in your business. Thank you very much. Thank you.